Today was leg day at the gym and that always puts me in a good mood. Because leg day and back day are my favorite exercise days. So to celebrate, we have this gorgeous looking integral here. It's the integral from zero to infinity of the cosine of x divided by pi squared minus 4x squared dx. And we're going to solve it using some beautiful complex analysis. And we have the perfect tool to start the solution development. It's Euler's beautiful formula, whereby we know we can expand e to the i x as the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x meaning that the target integral i is the real part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the i x divided by pi squared minus 4x squared dx. Now to define a suitable complex valued function f of z, and that would of course be e to the i z divided by pi squared minus 4z squared. Now let me take a moment to talk about the singularities involved here. The denominator of the function f of z approaches 0 as z approaches positive or negative pi by 2. And the cosine part of the exponential also approaches 0 as z approaches these two values. So that's a removable singularity for the cosine integral or the target integral. The problem arises because of the sine function. This thing does not approach 0 as z tends to positive or negative pi by 2, it'll tend to plus or minus 1 respectively. So these are the singularities we want to avoid in designing our contour. Now for the contour, I need the complex plane, so here it is, with the axes labeled as the real axes and the imaginary axes. I know exactly what to avoid. I need to avoid z being equal to negative pi by 2, and z being equal to positive pi by 2. So the contour I'm going to use here is a semicircular one with two holes punched in it to avoid the singularities. So we start our journey along the negative real axis and avoid the first singularity by skipping over it using the semicircular arc, continue our journey along the real axis and skip over the second singularity as well, and we move ahead just a little bit and loop everything back using this big old semicircle. Okay, cool. So the radius of the big semicircle, I'm going to call it uppercase R, so I have negative R here and positive R there. I'm going to call the radii of the smaller semicircles as epsilon, so let me just mark it up here. Yeah, that conveys the message quite nicely. And we traverse the contour in the counterclockwise sense as always. Okay, cool. Now, what about some more labeling on the real axis? Let me just get rid of this. And this point here means that negative pi by 2 is shifted behind by epsilon. And the other end of the diameter of the semicircle, I'll call this gamma 1, is negative pi by 2 shifted to the right by epsilon. Similarly, I'll call this gamma 2, and here I have pi by 2 minus epsilon and pi by 2 plus epsilon. I'll call the big semicircle as uppercase gamma, and I'll call the whole thing c. Now the integral over the closed contour c of e to the i z dz divided by pi squared minus 4z squared equals 0. Everything's nice and holomorphic on and inside the contour, and the contour doesn't enclose any poles, so there are no residues to calculate. So the integral sorts out to 0, but this one integral over the closed contour c is actually made up of quite a few integrals we see that we have this integral on the real line from negative r to negative pi by 2 minus epsilon. Then we have an integral over the curve gamma sub 1. Then we have another integral on the real line, this one from negative pi by 2 minus epsilon to positive pi by 2 minus epsilon. Then we have an integral over the curve gamma sub 2 plus another integral on the real line. This one's from pi by 2 plus epsilon to r, then another integral over the curve uppercase gamma. So the sum of all of these integrals equals 0. 
And remember, we're interested in the limiting cases of r going to infinity and epsilon going to zero. So what happens when we apply these limits to this collection of integrals? Well, that means we have zero equal to the integral from negative infinity to negative pi by two plus the integral over gamma sub one plus the integral from negative pi by two to positive pi by two plus the integral over gamma sub two plus the integral from pi by two to infinity plus the integral over uppercase gamma. Now notice that some of these integrals are linking up quite nicely. The integral from negative infinity to negative pi by two can be combined with this integral and the result can be further combined with this integral here, giving me the integral from negative to positive infinity. And because you're on the real line, you're on the real axis, you don't have to use the z notation anymore. You can just replace all the z's by x's. So we have e to the i x divided by pi squared minus 4 x squared dx plus the remaining integrals. We have the integrals over the two smaller semicircular arcs, gamma sub 1 and gamma sub 2, plus the integral over the big semicircular arc, uppercase gamma. I've copied down the diagram for the contour to help visualize the parameterizations being used here. For the curve uppercase gamma, all complex numbers on it are modeled by z equal to r times e to the i phi, where phi varies from 0 to pi. For gamma sub 1, well, that's a circle of radius epsilon that's been shifted by negative pi by 2 to the left. Okay, so that would be negative pi by 2 plus epsilon times e to the i phi. And similarly, for gamma sub 2, we have z being equal to pi by 2 plus epsilon times e to the i phi, where phi belongs to this interval between 0 and pi. Okay, so I'm going to deal with the integral over uppercase gamma first. So that's the integral of e to the i z divided by pi squared minus 4 z squared dz. I'm going to write this as the integral over gamma of 1 by pi squared minus 4 z squared times e to the i z dz to draw some parallels with an integral I can invoke. To draw parallels with an integral I'm going to use to invoke Jordan's lemma. So According to Jordan's lemma, if you have this structure that is the integral over semicircular arc gamma of a function f of z times e to the i a z, where a is some positive real number, and in this case we see that a equals 1. So if you have the structure and the function f of z is such that it's holomorphic outside a circle of finite radius, and we see that our function, pi squared, uh, 1 by pi squared minus 4 z squared, is holomorphic outside a circle of radius equal to pi by 2. And also, the function needs to be bounded. And in this case, we have the reciprocal of a polynomial. So yes, it is bounded as well. Which means we can invoke Jordan's lemma, which states that the limit of this structure as r tends to infinity is zero, which is quite convenient indeed. So we're rid of the integral over uppercase gamma, and we're left with the integrals over lowercase gammas. So the integral over lowercase gamma one is the integral from, well, we're traversing gamma one in the clockwise sense. So phi here, varies from pi to zero. So we're integrating from pi to zero, e to the i z, and z here is negative pi by two plus epsilon times e to the i phi. And this is being divided by pi squared minus four z squared. So we have negative pi by two plus epsilon times e to the i phi whole thing squared. Now, if z equals negative pi by 2 plus epsilon times e to the i phi, this implies that dz equals epsilon times i times e to the i phi d phi. Okay, cool. So 
now what? And we're interested in the limiting case of epsilon going to zero. So what does that mean for our integral? You know what, let me first expand the numerator of the integrand a bit. So on the right hand side, I have the limit as epsilon tends to zero of the integral from pi to zero of e to the negative i pi by two times e to the i times epsilon times e to the i phi. Then you have this i times epsilon times e to the i phi d phi as well, and divide everything by pi squared minus four times negative pi by two plus epsilon times e to the i phi whole thing squared. Okay, cool. Now in the numerator, I have e to the negative i pi by two. This thing here equals negative i. And negative i times positive i is negative i squared, which is negative negative one. So these two just cancel out to give you one, which means I'm left with the limit as epsilon tends to zero of the integral from pi to zero of e to the i epsilon e to the i phi times epsilon times e to the i phi d phi divided by pi squared minus four times negative pi by two plus epsilon times e to the i phi whole thing squared. Now, in the limit as epsilon tends to zero, I'm getting this zero by zero structure. So I should use L'Hopital's rule to first evaluate the limit of the integrand. So I have the limit as epsilon tends to zero of epsilon, this thing here would approach e to the zero, which is one. So that's not a problem. The problem is given by epsilon divided by pi squared minus four times negative pi by two plus epsilon times e to the i phi squared. So applying L'Hopital's rule, that gives me the limit as epsilon tends to zero of one by negative four times two, which is an eight, and I have negative pi by two plus epsilon times e to the i phi, and because of the chain rule, I also have e to the i phi. Okay, and wait, let me just give myself some writing space by shifting this whole thing to the left. And there you go, much better. Now in the limit as epsilon tends to zero, I have one by negative eight times negative pi by two times e to the i phi. Some nice cancellation taking place here, giving me e to the negative i phi divided by four pi. And this implies that the limit of the integral over gamma one as epsilon tends to zero sorts out to the integral from pi to zero of what exactly did I leave out? I left out this thing just gave me a one as epsilon tended to zero and I'm left with this thing times whatever the limit was. So I have e to the i phi times e to the negative i phi divided by four pi integration with respect to phi, giving me, again, some nice cancellation, one by four pi times negative pi, or negative a quarter, which is cool. Also, using the same approach, the limit of gamma sub two as epsilon tends to zero is also negative one quarter. So with all the integrals sorted out, it's time to just piece everything together. So we have zero equal to this integral, which is pretty much the target integral, e to the i x divided by pi squared minus four x squared dx, plus the two little gamma integrals evaluating out to negative a quarter. So that gives me negative one by two on combining them. And the integral over uppercase gamma is of course zero. So this implies that the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the i x divided by pi squared minus four x squared dx equals one half. 
and we're interested in the real part of this integral to give us the cosine integral. So let me just take the real part of the whole thing. And one thing worth mentioning here is that the imaginary part of this integral gives me sine x divided by pi squared minus 4x squared, which is an odd function of x. So it does make sense for it to evaluate to zero because we're integrating it on a symmetric interval. So it does make sense for the right-hand side to contain a zero imaginary part, but strictly speaking, this integral does not converge. It is zero, but in the principal value sense. Anyway, we're interested in the cosine integral. So taking the real part gives me the integral from negative to positive infinity of cosine x dx divided by pi squared minus 4x squared equal to 1 half, which is extremely cool. And the target integral was that from 0 to infinity. And the integrand is an even function of x, so we can just half the result. So we have cosine x dx divided by pi squared minus 4x squared, the interval being 0 to infinity, and this sorts out to a quarter. Or we could say that this is a really fancy way to write the number one, which is extremely cool. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.